Hello, welcome, and thank you for joining us. It's Monday, July 15th. You're watching News 2 on VIA Channel 4 and 504. I'm Leslie Camis Young. Topping our stories tonight, another Virgin Islands politician has announced that she will be returning campaign contributions from one of Jeffrey Epstein's companies. Following inquiries about campaign donations from the billionaire recently arrested on child molestation charges, Senator Alicia Barnes stated in an email on Saturday that after a careful review view of her campaign finances, her team found that a check in the amount of $1,000 was received from Southern Trust Company, a company owned by Epstein, a beneficiary of the Economic Development Authority. Barnes initially responded last week Thursday that she did not receive any donations from Epstein, but that changed on Saturday after her team combed through their campaign contribution records. Now Barnes said when the donation was received in 2018, it did not raise concerns. However, quote, in light of the allegations made and the previous disposition of Mr. Epstein's legal issues, unquote, her campaign will return the $1,000 to Southern Trust Company, Inc. via certified mail today, Monday the 15th. Barnes said she only knew of Southern Trust ties to Epstein after recent media reports. When asked why she decided not to donate the money to charity, Barnes said tainted money is tainted money, and if it's not worthy of being a campaign contribution, then it's not worthy of going to non nonprofits who do good work in the community. Sitting senators who said they did not receive Epstein donations include Senators Novell Francis, Allison DeGazan, Oakland Benta, Stephen Payne, Janelle Sorrow, Javon James, Myron Jackson, Stedman Hodge, Adniel Bobby Thomas, and Marvin Blyden. Senators who have yet not to respond to our inquiries sent to their Senate emails were Senators Dwayne DeGraff, Kenneth Gittins, Kurt Viele, and Donna Fred Gregory. Government House's director of Communication, Mr. Richard Mata Jr. responded on behalf of Governor Albert Bryan Jr. saying that the governor did not receive any campaign contributions from Epstein. We'll keep you updated. Last week, News 2 brought you highlights from a public education forum. At the forum, the St. Croix superintendent revealed that the Virgin Islands Department of Education is embarking on two new technology initiatives that include a mobile tech lab and mobile Wi-Fi hotspots. The department states that the two initiatives will provide students access to the Internet while at home in order to complete homework assignments. The department has ordered and has an island now, two Wi-Fi vehicles, you'll see them going around, one of them, they're having the labeling done to identify them as Wi-Fi vehicles, and we're also getting a Wi-Fi bus laboratory that will be in our housing communities so that students who can't afford computers can go to the bus at specific times in the afternoon and early evenings and use the equipment on that bus to complete assignments that are internet based. So it is something that is definitely a priority. It is on our radar to make sure that internet services in all of our schools and uh, activity centers is reliable and high speed. According to the Department of Education, the two tech initiatives are under the Education Reform Project, funded through the Department of Education's federal consolidated grant. The mobile tech lab will provide a supplemental technology lab that will rotate to schools within the district during the course of the school day. The bus will be retrofitted with everything necessary for a state-of-the-art technology lab. During after-school hours, to 5 p.m. the lab will be stationed at either of the two high schools so students can do college and career preparatory work and assignments. The mobile tech lab will also be connected to the VI Education's current network. The tech lab is expected to be on island by December 31st of this year. The mobile Wi-Fi hotspots, also called homework zones, will provide two SUVs, one stationed in the west and the other in the east. This will serve as a mobile hotspot station for students to gain access to the internet while at home again. The SUVs will drive through the surrounding neighborhoods of the Department of Education schools or may be stationed directly at a school and provide Wi-Fi access to the neighboring communities. Wi-Fi is being provided through reach communications. Neighborhood rotation schedules will be announced at a later date. 
Virgin Islands police officers were dispatched to the Walter I.M. Housing community in Frederickstead early Sunday morning on June 7th. A video circulating on social media shows four women assaulting an individual. The VIPD arrested Victoria, Victoria Parija, 25 years old, Angelica Perez, 20, Christina Perez, 26, and Crystal Perez, age 27. The victims of the assault identifies as transgender. According to police records, the victim stated that she had a verbal altercation with Victoria Parija that ensued into a physical altercation. The victim said that Parija then let the air, left the area in a car and returned with the three Perez women. The victim further stated that the women yelled that she would take off her clothes because he is a homosexual and carries himself as a female. However, in her statement to police, Victoria Parija said she was putting her baby in a car outside of the housing community when the victim approached her, cursing and asking if she wants to fight with a wrench in his hands. Although all four women were charged with third-degree assault in connection with the altercation, and a bond was set in the amount of $25,000 for each of the individuals, a Superior Court judge released the women on their own recognizance. No bail had to be paid. The LGBTQ group One Love, Inc., along with a list of nonprofit organizations, is urging the local authorities to look Look further into this case. The group hopes that residents will not condone violent behavior against LGBTQ residents. Um, we released uh, the letter in collaboration with Women's Coalition, DVSAC, with Men's Coalition, uh, AARP of the Virgin Islands, with um, St. Croix Pride, with Ferdinand Health Healthcare, um, because we wanted to bring attention to the case. We um, were reading the report in the Avis. We saw that um, the we saw that there was an attack on a transgender woman, and that uh, she, um, the, the suspects were um, the suspects were arrested, but then um, released shortly afterwards, um, which baffled the police. And according to the report, so um, we definitely urge the authorities to pursue this case so that justice can be obtained. Um, the victim. Um, uh, you know, the victim um, is all right physically. Um, they definitely um, will be having to deal with the emotional repercussions of this attack for some time. And it's very important for her and for people who are like her to know that their safety is taken into account. Meanwhile, Customs and Border Patrol agencies recently some $3.7 million in cash left abandoned in a boat on the shore of Puerto Rico that appeared to be headed to the U.S. Virgin Islands. This is according to a CBP announcement on July 9th. According to Customs and Border Protection, border agents as well as Drug Enforcement Administration agents seized the money found in five duffel bags aboard a vessel near Fajardo. CBP Air and Marine Operations operations agents detected the vessels heading from Fajardo to the Virgin Islands with its lights off. They requested a Marine Patrol aircraft to conduct surveillance. The vessel then abruptly turned around and headed back to Fajardo, landing near Rio Fajardo. According to CBP agents in pursuit, they saw that the suspects unloaded the five duffel bags from the vessels before abandoning the money and running away. Agents also seized a loaded Taurus 40 caliber pistol and and 63 rounds of ammunition. Now, according to authorities, the seizure was made under failure to declare and, and bulk cash smuggling laws. Johnny Morales, director of air and marine operations for the Caribbean Air and Marine Branch, said they remain committed to working with federal and local law enforcement to detect and deter smuggling attempts through the Caribbean. Virgin Islands Port Authority Executive Director Carlton Dow recently sent out a statement dismissing reports that the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line has canceled an additional six calls to the U.S. Virgin Islands. According to Dow, eight calls by the allure of the seas were indeed previously canceled due to issues with the ship's propulsion system, but there are no additional cancellations. According to the Virgin Islands Port Authority, there are in fact six additional calls by Royal Caribbean's Empress of the Sea 
Seas, one call to St. Croix and five calls to St. Thomas. The Empress of the Seas is a smaller vessel than the Oasis class Allure, but its added six call its added six calls will help to lessen the impact of the losses from the canceled Allure calls, according to Dow. The six added calls were scheduled for the following dates: June 19th at the Anne E. Abramson Marine Facility on St. Croix, then the Austin Bay Monsanto Marine Facility in Crown Bay on St. Thomas. There was already one call on June 20th. Upcoming dates include July 18th, August 15th, September and October 30th. For more information on the Port Authority's cruise ship schedule, you can go to www.viport.com. Coming up next, highlights from the 31st annual Bastille Day Tournament on St. Thomas, plus a look at regional news. Don't go away. Welcome back. Anglers from all over the territory headed out to sea early on Sunday for the 31st annual Bastille Day Kingfish Tournament. It is an annual competition to see who catches the heaviest kingfish, but it also marks a tradition known as Bastille Day, commonly referred to as the National Day of France that commemorates the anniversary of the storming of the Bastille on July 14, 1789. On Sunday in Hall Bay, tourists and locals alike, including Governor Albert Bryan, Jr. gathered to witness the well-loved event which featured music, food, moko jumbies, and of course the spe spectacle of big kingfish and barracudas that were being hauled in by victorious anglers. In the end, the crown could only go to one winner and that honor went to Feel Goods Fishing, Matthew Bryan, who reeled in a 43-pound whopper. News 2, Ciro Burke was there, and here's more. What are you representing? Uh, feel Good Fishing. And Feel Good Fishing. I see you feeling awfully good with that big fish that you caught. That's right. What time were you out there? We were out there from 5 o'clock in the morning. All right. And talk to me, Matthew. Um, what was your strategy to capturing this big fish? Just keep trying. Keep trying. Well, congratulations. How much is the weight? 43 pounds. 43 pounds. As you can see, they got a big one today. What was that experience like? Fantastic. And what did you do? How it, did you it, play into this team? It was exhilarating. We put in our hard work, rigged the lures, had everything ready to go. Now, I hear you fishermen were out there early this morning. What time did you go out? 4.15. 4.15 in the morning. So is it true that the early bird gets the fish? I guess. I'm telling you. And what can we look for more for today? Hopefully uh, no one beating us. <laughs> no one beating you. And how much was yours weighed in already? 31.1 pounds. 31.1 pounds. That is the pound to beat at the weigh-in. What's experience like for you going out there fishing? It was fun. It was long uh -huh. and hot. Hard. Okay. Yeah. All right. And what was it like for you? Is this your first time or how no, many years we, have you been participating? No, we go every year. Every year. And talk to me about this particular catch this year. Um... You know, we did what we could, you know. It was nice, it was alright. They were, they were biting all right. We got three fish. Yeah? Not too shabby. Not too shabby? We got a smaller boat, so it's not, uh, we couldn't go too far, but we got a good, we got a good, good fishing out of it. I see that you're a good contender, so have you gotten yours weighed in as of yet? Yes, this was 22 pounds. Uh, the bigger one was 17-ish, uh, I can't remember the exact thing, uh -huh. and I don't remember this one, but it was good. It was, yeah. So you had a great day. Great day. And how long have you been competing in Bastille Kingfish this Tournament? My, this is my first one. All right, well, I see you started off on the right track. Yep. Oh my God, I'm always having a good time, but it's always good to be in Hall Bay. I uh, woke up early this morning, got a little exercise, and you uh -huh. know this governor thing uh -huh. gonna make you mad, uh -huh. right? <laughs> you gotta keep it moving, and that's why we're here. I do, uh, you know, we're, we're leaving this afternoon, we're going to Miami to check out some things for the health insurance. Okay. Uh, I'll be back on Tuesday, but wanted to make sure I came down to Hall Bay, um, and especially celebrating Bastille Day, man. Our French heritage is rich in St. Thomas and the Virgin Islands, so it's always good to come down here and, and land with the French, you know? Yeah. Um, I remember my grandmother when I was very young taking me down to uh, French town to buy fish. Um, always been a rich part of our, our culture, so it's good to see it keeping on. And you know, it's funny now, it's just like Hispan the Hispanics in our community, um, the French cultures have married in, so you have Frenchies in all colors, shapes, all and forms. Safe, Isn't that beautiful? Safe, all safe. I love it. 
parents of children with autism spectrum disorder are well aware of the fact that caring for these children has its unique rewards and challenges. One school on St. Croix is offering a curriculum that caters to the needs of these kids. Coral Reef Academy recently announced that their enrollment period for the school year of 2019 to 2020 is now open. Parents with students in kindergarten through high school who have a diagnosis of autism are encouraged to take advantage of the application period, which ends August 16th, 2019. According to the Academy, the curriculum is uniquely designed to provide students with instruction in basic subjects, including reading, language arts, math, science, and social studies, as well as enrichment opportunities in arts, music, and physical education. Their new facility will also provide children with a sensory room that has tools and equipment to help them regulate their senses, especially when they're experiencing sensory overload. Coral Reef Academy opened last year. For more information, contact Christina Barry through email and the website on your screen. Again, the application period ends August 16th. Turning our attention to the Caribbean, the Commonwealth of Dominica's police force is facing a challenge. Police officers are being called upon to do their police officers, excuse me, are being called upon to do their job in combating what may could be considered public displays of lewdness in the community. Andrea Louis of Channel 5 News reports. The CDPF was put in the spotlight by the Dominica Association of Evangelical Churches, DAEC, earlier this week. The association was speaking out on increased incidents of indecent dressing and behavior by Dominicans in public. The DAEC is of the view that those in authority should not turn a blind eye to the laws of the land, but instead play their role to uphold these laws. In my view, what's there are laws on the books, laws on the books and laws on the books. And if there are laws on the books, then the upholders of the law must ensure that the laws are upheld. Once you start deciding on which law to uphold and which one not to uphold, you begin to bring your professional integrity into question. And once your professional integrity is in question, then people are going to flaunt other laws right before you because you have allowed some others to, to, to go on unchecked. So yes, they do have a role to play. As a citizen, as a citizenry, we, we have to do quite some work on it. And the church is 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 relentless in, in, in trying to ensure that we curb this thing. But those who are responsible, the professionals responsible for upholding the law, must themselves uh, execute whatever they have to do in that regard. Outside of this week's press conference, the DAEC has also used other avenues to advocate for proper dressing and the public department among Dominicans. One of the things we, we can safely say is there is an ongoing effort within our churches to educate. Some of us here are also involved in media, some of us are also involved in radio, so we do that type of stuff too, to, to spread the message around. And there are those who, we, we, we hit the streets with just the old admonition. What we have discovered though sometimes, when we would, let's say, confront or speak to some persons in that respect, we are attacked in that respect. It's almost like you are taken to task for seeking to address that. Will that stop the campaign? Will that stop it? No, it won't stop it. But these are some of the things we encounter as we develop with that. The implication of these types of behavior on the future moral fabric of society is significant as it impacts future generations. Public indecency generally refers to acts involving nudity or sexual activity in view of the public, often with the intent to shock, offend, or arouse. It includes offenses like indecent exposure and lewd conduct. Lewdness, however, is of a higher level of offensiveness than indecency. It denotes public sexual activity, for example, people engaged in sexual intercourse or other overt sexual contact in the view of the public or someone displaying his or her genitals in an aroused state. The implications to the future moral fabric of society is huge when one considers how young ones growing up and being exposed to these acts will now begin to view the world and others in it. 
the potential of the mindset that we are nothing more than our bodies and that we should seek to titillate others to get satisfaction and approval is in danger of being the norm in young ones seeing such acts. The DAEC also plans to hold community outreach sessions and target the schools to educate the public on the value of their bodies. And Railway, Channel 5 News. Thank you for that report. Coming up next, your News 2 AccuWeather forecast. Stick around. I hope you had a wonderful day today. The weather has been great. That's because we have dry air in place. So we're mostly dry and sunny. Taking a look at the satellite, not a whole lot going on here further to the north. Now to the south, yeah, we are seeing some moisture, some showers and storms, but that's not going to reach us with that dry air in place. We'll see mostly sunny and dry conditions. For tonight, we're at 80 degrees, mainly clear. Tomorrow, St. John is up to 90 degrees. Lots of sun sunshine, so make sure you lather on that sunblock. You'll need it. In St. Thomas, we'll see a high of 90, mostly sunny skies, and in St. Croix, 90 degrees, mostly sunny and dry. Now, the ocean is a bit rough. Those trade winds, they are moderate right now, pretty frisky, so we do ask you to use caution if you're boating on the Atlantic side. The waves 3 to 5 feet and the winds out of the east 10 to 15 knots. That has increased over the last couple of days. Small craft to use caution in place for the Caribbean side as well. Three to five feet for the waves and the winds out of the east from 10 to 15 knots. Now you'll notice some changes come Wednesday. That's when a tropical wave comes rolling on through. It's going to bring us a couple of showers late Wednesday, really into Thursdays when you should pack the umbrella just in case. Still sunny but a chance of a shower or two. By Friday, still seeing some of those lingering showers, and that will be the case into Saturday as we return to our typical pattern of mostly sunny skies with a stray pop-up shower. Temperatures, well, they'll be in the 90s until Thursday with those extra clouds and showers. The high will only be 89, returning to 90 again, though, by Friday and through the weekend. I hope you have a great night. Thanks for that. Coming up next, Gary Anthony is back from vacation and he has a full dose of sports on News 2. We'll be right back. I'm Gary Anthony and this is News 2 Sports. The Virgin Islands Horse Racing Commission held their monthly meeting today in the conference room at Henry Rolson Airport. While they did not have a quorum, in attendance on St. Croix was Commission Chairman Jay Watson, Henry Shang, and via telephone from St. Thomas, Parks and Recreation Commission Commissioner Calvert White and Dr. Laura Palminteri, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine. Among the items on the agenda included a proposed mission statement, code of ethics for committee members, development rules and regulations for the conduct on racing in the Virgin Islands, budget and staffing needs of the VI Racing Commission, and the consideration of Garrett Ritter to serve as interim executive director for the VI Racing Commission at no charge to the commission. Mr. Ritter has extensive experience in the horse racing industry, including authoring horse industry legislation, uh, breeding inventive guide program legislation for the 31st legislature of the Virgin Islands. On Saturday, Blue's Backyard Barbecue hosted the second annual Cornhole Tournament, a benefit for the Fish with a Vet organization. The popular outdoor establishment was packed with players, fans, and well-wishers. Most also participated in the various raffles and prizes donated by various sponsors. 32 teams tossed bags for most of the afternoon in their attempt to win the cash prize of $300, and, well, the finals came down to two teams, Willie and Colt versus Frank and Barney. It was a close match, won on the final toss by Team Willie and Colt. But the real winner is the Fish with a Vet organization. I thought this was the best turnout we've had in a while. Being the second annual, we are really looking forward to the third annual. On the scale of 1 to 100, this was probably 150. Outstanding turnout. The, the event today is, I, I can't put into words how important it is. It raises money for the veterans on the island. We put up several memorials. We maintain the maintenance of them. We're working on a vet center to get put together to have a place for all the veterans on the island to come together, get to know each other, 
we help them any way we can. The, the best bet in today's world is, is go to fish with a vet, USVI. Dot com. Look at our website. We've got all the information you need on the website. Uh, there are contact phone numbers if you prefer to call. We'll be glad to talk anything through you, anything you want to know. If you didn't make it this year, please come out, see us next year. Support this great organization. Thank you. That's it for sports. Leslie, back to you. Thank you for that, Gary. And that's it for our show tonight. We're live on Facebook and YouTube and on VIA Channel 4 and 504 on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. Follow us on social media. Tag us on any stories you want to see on the news or send us a message on Messenger. You can also email us at newsdirector at tv2.vi. Thanks again for joining us on News 2. I'm Leslie Kamisiang, and we'll see you next time.